All right. Um, hello, Joel. <laughs> Elizabeth. Um, so lovely book. Um, lovely to be here talking to you about it. Um, shall we dive in? Let's do it. All right. Um, so before we get started uh, in, in much detail, do you want to say a little bit just about um, where this project uh, comes from, how it came to have the shape it does, just to give us a little bit of an introduction to it? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I just want to say <clears throat> thanks so much for agreeing to do this, uh, Elizabeth. Um, uh, uh, as so many people are. I'm a huge fan of your work, which has been had a massive influence on my life. So it's just a real honor to talk with you. Uh, and thanks so much um, uh, for the invitation from the uh, Anthony and the philosopher. Yeah, so this project, <clears throat> in some ways, um, comes quite directly out of my life, and specifically my life with my family. Um, my brother was born with cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, and hydrocephalus. He was my best friend. And um, because of the sort of body and mind he had, uh, he required a lot of care. And my mother ended up becoming disabled when I was around, I don't know, maybe eight or so is when her health problems, uh, to invoke your next book's title, uh, started really kicking in and she became a chronic pain sufferer due to a combination of things, uh, degenerative disc disease, TMJ, fibromyalgia, um, et cetera. And all my, my grandparents had various impairments and uh, illnesses related to cancer, related to any number of things. And so from as far back as I could remember, I was uh, either actively uh, uh, in caregiving for someone with a certain sort of disability and or myself acting as an advocate. Uh, and then as time moved forward, of course, I became uh, disabled, as happens to so many people through uh, various uh, psychiatric things. And my life experience showed me once I, once I finally got exposed to disability studies and philosophy of disability, it showed me to a large degree that many of the uh, historical issues related to thinking about disability in the Western intellectual tradition were just messed up. <laughs> it's just, um, they were misguided. There was stuff being left out. And then even in the more narrow space of disability theory and, and some pockets of philosophy of disability, it seemed like things could not capture, uh, or it seems like the debates uh, and the accounts could not capture the differences between how my brother uh, found himself in the world, my mother and I, not to mention any number of my other family members. And this book project is in many ways uh, an initial kind of volley. This, this comes out of what many moons ago was my dissertation project, is an initial volley to kind of jump in and try and clear the water a bit, um, both in terms of the history of uh, the, the quote unquote Western intellectual tradition, but especially this uh, underlying idea that disability is somehow automatically linked to pain or suffering, which is the main topic of the book is in many ways to show that there are links and can be links, but there is no necessary link there and try and tease out what, what in the world is going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of the things, of course, that as, as you describe it, is that this, this book is extraordinarily personal for you. Um, and one of the interesting things about the methodology is that you really, you foreground that um, in the project. It's not something that's sort of lurking under the surface. You know, you have this very vivid first person narrative from your mother um, about her just harrowing experience of, of living with chronic pain and you so you start from some of these personal narratives um to then build upwards so the, the way that the structure works is we we start with a personal narrative and then we build upwards to try to get the beginnings of um as you describe it like a, a phenomenology um for pain for, for chronic pain first and then for disability um as as you as you move on to show the, show the differences, um, so can you talk a little bit about how you you conceive of that methodology and the relationship between like your personal investment in this, the, you know, including your mother's narrative, but also just how you think of this project as someone who's who's trained in the tradition of phenomenology. What does it mean to foreground lived experience when you're talking about things like like pain or like disability? Yeah, th thank you for that question. I, uh, 
I look back on my early philosophical training and I'm just kind of grateful that I was around phenomenologist uh, because I think that honestly, that's probably one of the reasons I ended up going into this field as opposed to uh, others. I find uh, personally and also uh, professionally in the sense of how I think about what good theories and philosophical accounts can do, I find over and over again that beginning with lived experience, beginning with how people actually find themselves in the world uh, concretely uh, is one of the most powerful ways to come to appreciate new things about how the world is, about the sorts of people we are, uh, and also one of the most crucial ways to begin if one of our over um, uh, one of our ultimate aims is to try and change the world for better. I just think we have to have a good grip on how things are if we want to <laughs> articulate and fight for how things ought to be. Uh, and phenomenology is a method, you know, I try very hard to not get into the, the weeds because you ask two phenomenologists what phenomenology involves, you'll get two different answers, sometimes wildly different answers. But what I love about the tradition as a whole, whether we're talking about Husserl's early work or jump to Sarah Ahmed's uh, queer phenomenology that came out a number of years ago, what I love about the method as a whole is that beginning point of lived experience, an attempt to describe as accurately as possible how we find ourselves in the world, and that movement to then see, okay, well, what general structures appear here? What can we say that goes beyond the mere first person, goes beyond the mere uh, anecdotal, certainly, and that can give us insight into how things actually are. And then again, in my case, you know, very Hass, Hasslanger style and Barnes style, I want to know how things are uh, in the light of orienting myself towards a world that's more equitable and more just and, and trying to articulate how the world ought to be. So the personal in this book, in many ways, is not just a, hey, uh, here's my story, or in the case of chapter two, um, or chapter three, now I can't even remember, chapter two, I think, uh, here's my mom's story. Uh, it's more, let's start with how the sorts of experiences I've talked about, how those, how, how does this work out for a person? And then what comes out of that? And I do that over and over again, as you mentioned in the book, there's this, uh, this dance kind of between, well, here's theories that people have given. How about, how does that compare with like, how someone actually finds themselves, um, in a situation about which there's been a lot of theory. And as the, as the movement from the book goes from talking about disability to pain and then ability, you see these uh, differences. You keep seeing these differences between how accounts, some capture things very well, some really fail to, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know that you know, one, like obviously the, the real strength that this kind of methodology has is the way exactly as you say that that it it foregrounds the ways that people actually live and actually experience their lives and everything rather than sort of starting from first principles but one concern um that people sometimes raise about this kind of methodology um is that it can be too quick to generalize from the specifics of a person's lived experience and of course a person's lit you know a person's lived experience is never just the lived experience of disability or the like you can't you can't carve out the disabled parts of the person's experience and not include the class and the race and the you know all the, the various other intersectional and also just like the quirks of personality or like what has happened to them previously and they're like um and so I know that like, one concern that people sometimes voice about this type of methodology is like, it's one thing to use someone's lived experience as maybe like a counterexample to a view. It's like, here's this view. And you said that this is how things are, but your view about how things are doesn't seem to accommodate this person's life. What happens in the phenomenological uh, <laughs> phenomenological, it's not an easy thing to say, um, no. phenomenological tradition um, is that we then try to take these accounts of experiences and build back up, right? Structure back up from there. And I mean, you know, um, most of the, narr the narratives that are centerpiece, and this is not a criticism at all, this is, this is an observation, that are centerpieces in, in your work, they're, you know, white women in Western contexts. Um, and so I wonder if you have thoughts about like, what does that, 
is there a danger in thinking that that tells us something general about the experience of pain or the experience of suffering or the nature of um, disability more broadly? Um, and especially when we're doing things like constructing philosophical theories, is there something like a worry potentially of elite capture here that hmm. just like the worry for <laughs> to to uh, to cite your Georgetown? Oh, Femi Taiwo, yeah. yeah. Everyone <laughs> should go pick up that book too. By the way, Elite Capture comes out I think this month. Haymarket Books. Yeah, um, and in the meantime, you can read his article in the Boston Review um, <laughs> um, on uh, on identity politics and elite capture. So, um, so yeah, I, I, what are your thoughts on this? Because I, I know you you think carefully about these issues. So, yeah, that's such a great question. Um, so I'll, I'll just start with the the danger question more generally about the movement from to put it in a slightly different language, the movement from the particular to the universal. Uh, I think this is a constitutive problem for any theory that wants to begin with experience. Um, so it's a constitutive problem. I don't. I don't think just for phenomenology. That's it's true of intellectual history. It's true of sociology. You know, you name it. And one of the reasons I'm fond of phenomenology as a particular method is that from the very beginning, and I think this is safe to say of early, middle, late Husserl. This is certainly safe to say of Heidegger uh, and later thinkers. Phenomenology is, is admittedly and uh, self-consciously an open in, uh, in enterprise and set of discussions and debates. It, there is no final word on giving an account of how things are and appear to, to one another um, or appear to one. Um, and I really like that. I'm very, very fond of a method that says we're not... We, we do not believe and we do not hold that we are getting at some truth, capital T, or we're not getting to the real capital R. <laughs> this is not how things uh, are, capital A. No, that didn't work. I tried. Um, but instead, this is an inquiry that has certain limitations and it's done jointly. And a lot of the, I tried very hard to make the book actually enjoyable to read. So I submerged a lot of the kind of more painful philosophical moments into the footnotes. I also had to cut a lot of the footnotes. I am uh, I love footnotes, but in the footnotes, you'll notice that in these moments, for example, where the account I'm giving is a white woman in, in a, a, a global North wealthy country that's kind of built into some of the description, you'll see in the footnotes, these points, these uh, like, hey, if if I was talking more carefully about questions of racialization, if I was talking more carefully about the history of uh, colonialism and the role of, you know, all of this stuff, different things would come out here. And I'm positive different things would come out here. And I'm also positive that the account I give is limited, you know, in all sorts of ways. And what I would hope is that this sort of, uh, of a project, I guess if, I hope this is true of everything I write, um, it is supposed to contribute to a discussion with others, um, and just be like, hey, here's some extra stuff. Like, <laughs> I don't think it's remotely closed. And there are moments, like, if you look at the table of contents, I guess it is a little bit um, misleading because it'll say like, oh, phenomenology of disability. And then they're like, okay, is the A there? How particularizing of an account do you think you're giving, Joel? Um, and I hope that there are many revisions and corrections and additions and subtractions to the kind of moves I make. Um, and I also hope that, some, hopefully some, of the moves from description to reconstruction or to the, to the more general structures um, capture something. But that's for others to decide, not me. You know, I feel like it's like I'm just, I'm just handing this out there and then we'll see what happens. There's also one more uh, kind of dorky philosophy note to make is that th there are, I think, some really profound, um, I'll use the, that hated business term, synergies. Uh, between phenomenology and the pragmatist tradition. Um, you know, in my undergrad education, I was trained as much in, in uh, pragmatism, both classical and kind of neo-pragmatist forms, as much as I was in phenomenology. And this idea that truth uh, and this idea that inquiry, scientific inquiry, humanistic inquiry, social scientific, you name it, is geared towards uh, living our lives at the end of the day, helping us live our lives. It's geared, it's really geared towards questions of use more than some set of absolutes. I find that um, 
very powerful. And I find that honestly, just the best way to do research. <laughs> Certainly I find it a more honest way to do research. Um, but that also puts on the table, you know, I just, I'm not a Platonist. I'm not a, you know, any, any kind of uh, fundamentalist um, move or way of grounding. I usually have a very strong <laughs> reflex to. Uh, did I, do you feel like I su sufficiently, that was such a rich question. Um, I feel like I didn't get to all of it. You did great. Um, <laughs> so um, I um, I think maybe like the the central theme of the book, if I'm reading it correctly, and correct me if if this is if this is wrong, but you want to separate out, and you do this by focusing um, on experiences and, and differences in, in in experiences. You want to separate out. Um, the experience of pain and suffering, particularly extreme or consuming suffering, and then the experience of disability. And one of the things you want to say here is like, look, there's not no connection, right? Um, but there's nothing like the sort of perfect correlation that people seem to assume there is, or it's certainly people often conflate these. Um, and then they think that the moral attention that we give to extreme suffering is therefore the appropriate moral attention that we should give to disability. And you want to say, no, it is really important that we give our moral attention to extreme suffering. And then the ableist conflation, as you put it, is thinking that disability just is like a form of pain and suffering or extreme suffering. Um, can you... Can you give like an elevator pitch for how you think of that argument as working? Um, yeah, uh, so you nailed it. And yeah, the elevator pitch, which is probably going to be less eloquent than how you just put things. Uh, the elevator pitch is that when we look at the history uh, taken in, at a very broad scale of the quote unquote Western, obviously Western needs to be in quotation marks. The fact that we even include the Greeks, you know, there's a whole thing there. So please see the air quotes. Um, of the Western moral intellectual tradition, there is over and over again, um, whether we're looking at Aristotle, whether we're looking at Mill, whether we're looking at Kant, whether we're looking even at, um, heck, let's, let's throw Spinoza in the mix, uh, and especially book four and five of the ethics, you see this, oh, well, we want to minimize suffering and pain. This is obviously doesn't generalize to all moral traditions. There's certain ones where suffering is treated in, in a different way. I again try to address that in the footnotes so that I don't get lost in the weeds. Let's get rid of pain. Let's get rid of pain. Let's reduce suffering. That this this happens over and over again. If the ableist conflation is made, the ableist conflation of disability with pain and suffering, then right at the right at the very kind of almost first principles start of most moral traditions in the quote unquote West, we have a thought that disability is something that. Uh, is a, either involves a life not worth living, is something that should be reduced, da, 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 da. And the, the kind of analytically distinguishing between component pain, which you have to have to live a good life, between constitutive pain, which really sucks, and consuming pain, which is terrifying, helps us right there. You already have a, um, a, a way of saying, okay, what sort of pain are we talking about? And does the sort of pain that we're talking about that we're taking as an object of our social political institutions to try and minimize, does that actually link up with disability? And of course, one of the main arguments of the book is it absolutely does not link up with disability full stop, disability in general. There are a few cases of, there are a few types of disabilities where something like consuming pain is a part of it. And those we should definitely be having conversations about, you know, and I mentioned this, these are the, the what's that French phrase, the bet noirs of disability theory, infantile tay sacs, um, depending upon uh, lots of different factors, maybe, maybe also Edwards and Patau syndrome, uh, to, to take it even a, a step much further, infants and in Salafic infants. Um, there, of course, the question of suffering gets complicated if you don't have the organ of the brain, but nonetheless, uh, those should be talked about, but they need to be talked about as what they are, which is in a very distinct, in some ways, wildly, perhaps even categorically distinct 
uh, set of disabilities that involve those sorts of things that we probably do want to minimize in the world. And the vast majority of disabilities don't fall into that category. Um, and many of them not only don't fall into that category, but there is no intrinsic leak, as you, as you um, put it in the uh, landmark minority body, Oxford University Press 2016, Elizabeth Barnes, there is nothing uh, that defines disability in and of itself. There's nothing about the body that, uh, in and of itself that defines disability. Um, that is crucial. That is absolutely essential to have at the beginning of any account of how the world ought to be, of how we ought to treat each other, of how we ought to organize society. Um, and we sure as hell have to get it, do better, we humans, have to do better at opening up space for all those forms of disability that bring about all sorts of positive things and gains uh, and, and pride in, in the way that one's body mind is different. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, CODA just won, uh, just won Best Picture, even though all anyone could talk about was that other incident that night. And uh, one of the things that I find so powerful about the, you know, mainstream hearing world, learning more about deaf capital D cultures is this, oh, maybe there are ways in which deafness uh, is not only neutral with respect to well-being, but can actually be positive, can be a... Uh, uh, a question of, of deaf gain, uh, to use the term from that book, is it? I just forgot the title of the, the book, but it came out in like the, the, the mid aughts, if I remember correctly. Um, all right, now I'm just rambling, but uh, yeah, and, and I didn't give an elevator pitch. Wow, a double whammy there. It's a, it's a pitch <laughs> like, like a really long, when you're stuck in an elevator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't I, I highly recommend um, not getting stuck in an elevator when I give an elevator pitch. It's yeah, it's very bad. I'm so sorry. No, that was that was actually really informative. Thank you. Um, so um, based on what you said there and, you know, you might not have a take on this, which which is fine. But, you know, you, you mentioned um, some you know, obviously, as you said, the, the, the bet noirs of, of disability theory, but also, you know, in, in the book, you, you talk about your, uh, your mother's experience with uh, um, complex regional pain syndrome. Um, you know, we talk, sometimes we can talk about these things that are almost like, um, like pure pain phenomenon, where it's not just like there, there are other things that have pain associated with them. They're just like, it seems like the the entire experience of the condition is the experience of pain. And um, when we take a look at the spectrum of the, the kind of conditions that we are talking about here, do you think, um, it is, do you, do you think grouping all of these things together and calling them disabilities is helpful? Do you think it potentially obscures more than it um clarifies um do you have do you have a take on this uh the the um perennial taxonomic question regarding the concept of disability yeah i i really appreciate you asking me this question because in many ways this is the question i'm currently obsessed with right so the next book project yeah <laughs> the next book project um uh, which is under contract with Oxford University Press and will theoretically be done sometime next year, is, is trying to take this head on. And how do you, to, to slightly rephrase your question, on the one hand, it seems like there are really good political, uh, legal, and even personal reasons why we want an extremely broad category of disability. I mean, just think about the easiest example here is the language of the Americans with Disabilities Act which is uh, arguably so broad as to, <laughs> it's, no, it's not clear it's picking out a, 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 a meaningful set of anything in the world. It, that's, you know, that's, a, that's its own thing. And yet, we, I don't want the ADA to be more narrow uh, for all sorts of uh, reasons I could get into. At the same time that there's those sorts of, uh, there's a movement towards let's broaden, it seems that part of the problem, including maybe even the problem of the ableist conflation, is precisely because we use the, the concept of disability too broadly, and maybe we need more uh, a more nuanced taxonomy where we just stop calling chronic pain a disability in the same sense that we call achondroplasia a disability, 
you know, we just stop doing that. And I like having my cake and eating it too. And I think the way around this, I think you can give an account that would capture um, both of those sorts of practical and theoretical insights if you go a pragmatic route, if you look at the way we use the concept of disability, which uh, the way that I think about this now is that primarily the concept of disability is not picking out features uh, of the world or even features of a world that we would want to see. The concept of disability is primarily a term we use to provide justification, to provide reasons that we ought to structure the world in, in various ways. And I think that plays out at the level of individual agent speech acts and political act, speech acts and the way disability is used in something like the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Persons with Disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. But it's gonna take me at least a book uh, to put to like really dig into that argument. Um, so there's kind of uh, um, the, the philosopher in me answer, but let me give you the personal answer. Um, the personal answer is, you know, when my mom and I, especially when I was in the middle of writing those two chapters on pain, and we were talking about her experiences, we have this conversation about whether or not she herself identifies as disabled, and thinking through in her head what that meant. And like, one of the things was, the way she experienced her chronic pain was so wildly different than the way that Jason experienced his body mind. And yet, because of linguistic norms, let's say at minimum, of course, we'd always referred to Jason as disabled and never thought twice about that. And yet my mom then putting that category over both her son and herself, rose, it, it, it raised, uh, rose, rose, it arose, it caused to arise, verbs, verbs are terrible. Um, conjunction, yeah. Um, there were identity questions at play, there were political questions at play, you know, it was, it was, an extremely complicated question for her to think through. My sense is at this time, partially because of me uh, forcing exposure uh, uh, of a lot of uh, literature and philosophy of disability and disability studies, I think she's come to kind of, it makes more sense, but that took um, processing and reflective thought and all sorts of stuff. Um, so all instead of actually answering the question, I've just re, now I've just, re, uh, uh, further solidified why that's such an important question. Um, I don't have a definitive answer right now. I'll just say this. I, that depends on the day. Some, sometimes I want a more nuanced taxonomy that has more distinct and perhaps hardline categorizations and other days I don't. Um, and so you'll just, uh, pr I promise I'll have a better answer for you come this time next year. <laughs> I think it, you know, it, it is one of these things that's just particularly interesting because when you look at like the data on, you know, the, you get wildly different results for, you know, what group of people are the people with disabilities, depending on whether you're looking at who self identifies um, as disabled versus who claims disability benefits versus who counts as having a disability according to the ADA versus who like other people would describe as being disabled and, and so on and so forth. And I think, one, you know, um, there's also a little bit of a, of a type token question going. So one of the things you say in the book is that like the vast majority of disabilities don't have anything like a strong association with pain and suffering, but the vast majority of people who meet something like the ADA criteria for, or, you know, could claim a disability benefit or something like that. Like by far the most common conditions for um, workplace uh, accommodation or for um, uh, disability benefits, at least it's lower in back pain in particular, right? Isn't that the big one? So it's, it's, it's chronic musculoskeletal pain, things like fibromyalgia, nonspecific uh, pain conditions and mental health. Um, yeah. Uh, so this leads me to my final question. Um, if it's okay with you, since you have foregrounded the personal and you, you, you had a, a personal answer. Um, so you did mention your own experience as, uh, as coming to um, develop a disability in, in, in the process of this. Um, in your taxonomy talking about pain, it, it focuses primarily on physical pain. Um, and that 
sort of phenomenology of suffering as linked to the and of course we know that there's not a firm separation between um physical pain and psychological pain because uh you know things like depression and anxiety are major uh drivers in the development of certain types of chronic pain but also they can worsen chronic pain and also chronic pain can cause depression and anxiety. like all of this stuff is linked um pain is both a an emotional and a physical process no matter um you know what but let's talk specifically about just like non-physical forms of mental distress right so like um like anxiety or depression um do you have any thoughts you'd like to end on on, on how you see those as related to the types of suffering especially consuming suffering um, that you talk about. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I, I think I, I had major depression for many, 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 many years and went undiagnosed. And I think I had very severe GAD for many years that went undiagnosed. And then finally coming to realize uh, that those were uh, fundamental aspects of my life and then, uh, you know, engage with both psychology and, and psychiatry uh, and try and do various interventions the the way the relationship i have to what i think of as the pain and or suffering uh that is involved with depression and um and severe uh anxiety it has shifted a lot <laughs> over the last few years um and as i mentioned the acknowledgments of the book you know this this really was uh, almost completely finished by 2016 and I will not bore you with the very weird, windy story of why it took so long for the book to come out, but I would definitely rewrite, um, uh, especially the stuff on, on pain in such a way that it makes it explicit that I'm not trying, I did not mean to focus more so on physical, um, but I think that, that that actually ended up happening. Um, so thank you, thank you for pointing that out. I don't, hmm, how do I put this? One of the, the strengths of a phenomenological approach is that by beginning with an orienting inquiry around lived experience, existential answers are going to be uh, often the primary ones when we're talking about phenomenon. So uh, a good phenomenology of, I think, something like depression, uh, you're going to end up not allowing for you. You cannot come out of that with some Cartesian split between the body and mind. I, I've never seen that. And interestingly, I'm thinking of the work of people like Anthony Fernandez at University of Southern Denmark, who does phenomenological psychopathology, and the the way in which a focus on lived experience provides an, uh, a fully embodied non dualistic understanding of how people um, experience in that case, the language would be various pathologies or symptoms though that's not in a necessarily like uh, ontologically negative sense. Um, I, I find very promising as a route. It's not clear to me that the the kind of tripartite distinction between component constitutive and consuming would be necessarily different. Um, and the larger claims I make about it will be necessarily different for a phenomenon that we primarily describe as psychological as opposed to physical. And again, if that's right, it's because of the existential aspect. It's how I, it's the relationship one has to, um, to that sort of pain. And you can, you know, so to use the, the first person example of depression, there are times in which uh, it feels like a consuming sort of uh of suffering with proper medication and uh, and other sorts of things that can shift from being consuming to constitutive to even at times component when you know i'm able to function more or less uh, uh fluidly and that uh for me the shift is not so much I, i'm less interested in trying to give a causal account of what's going on there than I am in describing the ways in which that experience can modulate uh, between those types of the relationship between the quote unquote condition and the relationship between the affective or evaluative uh, pain sensations. 
And that I think is where, that's where the, the meat of the issue is. Like that's where our analysis should be um, focused. And this is why I just, I'll give a final plug that this is why I think some of the richest work being done in the social sciences, including stuff on the perennially nightmarishly complicated relationship between disability and quality of life, why bringing in phenomenological analysis uh, could actually bolster a lot of that qualitative social scientific work, whether it's in sociology or anthropology. Um, and I have a, I'm in the middle of a grant project <laughs> to, to try and uh, uh, lay out uh, what precisely that means in more detail and also programmatically, what would it mean for researchers to start uh, doing that uh, across the humanities and social sciences in a more serious manner. Europe, as in many things these days, is, is ahead of the, the game on this. There's a lot of this, this kind of crossover work being done there, including in medical schools. And over here, it's like, you know, I feel like 98% of medical professionals, if you say phenomenology, they're like, I don't want to talk to you anymore. So, you know, there's work to be done. There's, uh, there's, there's I think some, some fruitful stuff could come out of more of this, uh, the intersection of work uh, uh, between phenomenology and social sciences and also clinical practice. Fantastic. Um, well, given uh, where we are with the time, I'm going to shift over uh, to some of the questions that popped up um, in the Q&A bar. If you um, have uh, questions for Joel, um, we, there's no way we're going to be able uh, to get to them all, but uh, please do uh, pop them into uh, Q&A. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with a question from Mary Stevens. Uh, she says, I'm interested in the ways that philosophers can get a concept like disability so wrong. Um, how do philosophers tend to go astray and what lessons should we learn in order to do good or better work in this area? <laughs> uh, somewhere near the beginning of the book, I quote uh, Mary Midgley, who says, the history of ethics tells us uh, uh, more by what our sages omitted to mention than what they mentioned. And um, one response I would have to that great question is that philosophy has historically been uh, elitist, it's historically been uh, sexist, it's historically, you know, we could run through all of this stuff. And even who we think, you know, my PhD was in a program that's a history of philosophy program. And, you know, the movement from Plato, Aristotle, through the um, pick your favorite medievalist to then Descartes, and then Kant, the real fun stuff starts happening. Then, hey, you know, like this is a historical construction that came out of Germany when they were trying to assert that their the Aryan race was supreme. Like even that that lineage or the fact that we treat that as what Western philosophy is, and then don't see uh, not only the false um, racist construction of the quote unquote canon, but that each of those individual thinkers. I mean, take a close look at Aristotle. He thought that some people were born natural slaves. He thought women were essentially mutilated men. Take a look at Kant's views uh, uh, on race, where he had this uh, quadrite, um, quad, yeah, I won't, we don't need to go into it. The point is, these thinkers, so many of these thinkers uh, that we treat as canonical had wildly problematic starting points and had wildly pro problematic premises that informed uh, their thinking. Um, and so how, how can philosophers get a concept like disability so wrong? Privileged, racist, <laughs> colonizing assholes are a lot of the people who have been propped up as this is what philosophers say. Um, so there's the really negative part. The happy part, I do see this changing. It's not changing fast enough. It's not changing enough, but there are, a, you know, what, at least my sense of the field is that pluralistic views to all sorts of things, more critical views, um, and views of people who are not coming from a default privileged position. These are finally starting to get at least a little bit more airtime, but there's still a massive amount of work to be done to de-elitify, to make, to make philosophy more anti-racist, to make philosophy more actively anti, you know, there's so much that needs to be done. A um, lot of work. Yeah. A lot of work to do. I think it's probably also, I mean, I'm not sure what you think about this, but I, I do think that um, one of the unique things about disability and, and about uh, theorizing disability is both exactly as we were talking about that it, 
we're not a hundred percent sure that there's a there there in the first place, but insofar as there is something that that we're talking about um, that's unified, I think disability is for most people, you know, it's it's closely tied to a lot of our sense of of our own fragility, our own um, mortality, our own uh, aging. Um, you know, disability, I think, in, in most people's heads is closely tied to either um, illness or aging or like these, this sense of like, and which I think is like often philosophers are particularly uncomfortable with. It was like, oh, why do I, why do I have to have a body in the first place? You know, <laughs> why can't I just be a Cartesian soul? Um, but I think, you know, you don't have to, for a lot of other things that we're talking about, you don't have to, um, you know, worry that like, if you're straight, you're not going to like wake up tomorrow and be gay, um, but you might wake up tomorrow and be disabled. Um, or, you know, you're, it might happen to your kids or it might happen to your partner. Or, and I think like that, and I don't by any way, shape or form want to say that that fear is wrong or that fear is bad. Like, of course you'd be scared of that. Um, but I think that can sort of implicitly affect in, um, affect theorizing in ways that are kind of interesting um, and so you're getting that perspective but less often the perspective of the people who are like yeah I'm actually like it's maybe not as bad as <laughs> you thought yeah. yeah and I try I try to get into this a little bit in I think chapter five so the the talking the conversation about ability and where I talk about this, you know, common sense, and I'm I'm just saying stuff that disability studies scholars have said since the 80s, but this this common sense idea that who I am is, is based on what I can do. And therefore, if I woke up tomorrow and I became disabled because something happened in the middle of the night or a bus drove into my room and hit me and the, I, I don't, um, the, the idea that then there, one will automatically become something else or someone else is very visceral. And I agree with you. I don't want to tell people that their feelings are wrong per se, but there is a fear aspect here that is misidentifying uh, um, the nature of the self, <laughs> or it's premised upon a, a misunderstanding of the nature of the self. It's premised upon a misunderstanding of the relationship between uh, oneself and one's abilities, uh, which is far more malleable than I think uh, most people uh, uh, tend to appreciate. And also it's again, the idea that that will automatically be bad. I mean, it will probably be bad that next day. And depending upon what happens, social scientific research suggests really significant ability transitions like going from ambulatory to uh, uh, paralyzed from the neck down, you know, that's very hard. But most of that research shows over and over again that people come to find new normals, new modes of flourishing, come to still very much value being alive and engaging in this uh, uh, messy uh, dance we do as humans. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I am always hesitant to give too much room to that. Well, of course people are afraid of, I don't know, becoming old or whatever. And also the aging thing also brings out interesting complications because uh, quote unquote American society's relationship to aging is just <laughs> Let's just say that there are there's anthropological, uh, you know, if we look to research and cultural anthropology, we would view that understanding of aging as something to be feared and bad as ass backwards relative to how many, many different societies um, understand it. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot there's a lot to be said there, but. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll stop. I'll stop on that. Okay, well, awesome. There's a, there's a related question. Think of this as like a follow-up. Um, so it's, uh, please, can you say something about Peter Singer's influential position on disability? Um, in many ways, Singer seems to capture a sort of common sense position on disability. Do you believe that this type of common sense position can be significantly shifted as the default or mainstream one? And do you think it's already happening? Yeah, this, uh, First point is I look forward to the day that no one asks about Peter Singer when we're talking about disability. Uh, I think we can get there and we're already on the way there. Um, so I guess that answers the second part. I, I do think it's possible 
for, I do think, I think it's already in motion for years now, people have read singers views on disability and seen it for what it is, which is just common sense ableism parading around as reflective thought. Um, and I don't have a lot of patience, as you can tell by my affect and tone right now. I don't have a lot of patience for singers work on this area for not just that reason, uh, but also because of the relationship he has to social scientific uh, evidence and empirical work. Um, and whether we're talking about, you know, some of the comments he makes in uh, animal liberation, or we're talking about some of the comments he made in the 90s, you know, I look at those footnotes and I go, you're literally not engaging in the appropriate research to back up anything you're saying. This is why people don't take philosophers seriously. Can we actually, you know, engage with the phenomenon in a responsible manner? Um, and, and I see where work, where work is going in philosophy of disability and where work has been in disability studies from the beginning is one that is genuinely engaged with multiple methods and modes of inquiry about the phenomenon in question, namely disability in this case. And so the, the common sense moves, the, but of course I da da da, or of course uh, my parents would love me more if I had better eyesight, as he recently said in an interview a couple of years ago. You know, these sorts of claims, I think people are like, why, why would we take this seriously? This isn't, um, you know, this isn't the sort of reflective thought one would hope for from a, from a professional uh, academic and, and researcher. So yeah, I think it's getting better. And I think that uh, I would hope that down the road, um, we can just look back on those sets of debates around disability and, you know, take the view that, that well, I think if, if you, um, if anyone in the audience hasn't read Eva Kate's piece, uh, the personal is political is philosophical, uh, notes on the battlefield from a mother. Um, that I think was the final word on all of these debates <laughs> in, my, in, in my mind, specifically the, the speciesist debates. Um, but, in, but We'll see. we'll see, we'll see where it goes. I'll throw out one more thing, just since um, Singer has been brought up. There's been some very interesting work coming out in the last three years on the relationship between dehumanization and speciesism. Um, some people have made this connection explicitly, some haven't. I myself am working on a piece right now that I'm still, I'm still thinking through it. But one of the things that drives me most up a wall about the, um, anti-speciesist uh, way of relegating certain people with disabilities to a lesser uh, moral realm based upon their capacities is that it just flies in the face of all of the best research in social psychology <laughs> about how humans actually think about each other, about how social action is organized around in and out group sorting and whatnot. Um, and I find, uh, I see a path uh, I see a path, I think a number of other scholars see a path where you can both be anti-speciesist and not have to throw uh, organisms born of other human organisms uh, out of the moral universe. And that's entirely compatible. Um, and it is something we should all think uh, slash we should all want to have to be compatible given the evidence we have uh, on how people treat each other when they don't make that move. Um, this complicated uh, is odd stuff going on there. And I realized that, but I'll, that will be in the footnotes of the, you know, I, I can't, I can't go into that too much right now. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, we only have time, uh, for one more brief question. So apologies to everyone's question, um, that I have not been able to get to, but I am going to ask Joel this, uh, just final, really interesting question about his own process. Um, so, uh, working with lived experience is incredibly necessary, but it can also be emotionally challenging, at least in my experience. Um, I would be interested to hear any thoughts Joel might have on the emotionality of the research and writing process. Woo! Oh my, what a, what a, <clears throat> what a good question and a intense one to end on. Yeah, I mean, there's <clears throat> uh, uh, a lot of these pages uh, had tears um, on them. Uh, as they were being written, and sometimes even as they were being reread, because in some ways writing this, uh, especially certain parts of it, was a kind of therapeutic exercise of processing things that had happened 
um, in my life happened to my family members uh, and very, very painful, very hard, um, traumatic things. Uh, and I don't, you know, uh, in some ways I'm like, I, I do not wish that sort of process upon others. <laughs> like it's not, you know, I'm not going to say it's fun. Um, but I feel I'm the sort of person where I feel like I have to work through it. Um, that's just part of the, uh, I don't want to say healing process that that term bothers me, but the, that's part of working through is doing this sort of work. Um, and it does make it hard. It makes it because you just can't, you know, I can't, I can't, um, bracket myself as a person working on this stuff. There is no way though, as the brilliant Elizabeth Barnes also mentioned in, in the minority body, right in, in the, I think this was in your preface, Elizabeth, um, there's this idea that disability is only per personal for some people, but insofar as everyone is invested in the abilities they have or do not have, disability is personal for everyone. Um, and I think that work on disability insofar as it admits that and takes that on board, it's only going to make it better. And that goes as well for any number of other socially central aspects of human life, whether it's sexuality, whether it's questions of uh, race and ethnicity, you name it. Um, I, I think philosophy is just, it's better when the personal, instead of being bracketed, is made part of the reflective inquiry. But often doing that is, yeah, very uh, hard uh, emotionally. And um, yeah, I just hope, you know, you got to have, I, ho I hope that people who engage in this type of work have good friends, have, hopefully have a good psychologist, hopefully have access to, to mental health care and meds if they need it. Of course, if you live in the US, you probably don't because we suck on that, like uh, other things in our healthcare system. But yeah, it's hard. It's definitely, uh, it was difficult writing this. <laughs>